Pastors, what are they? Well, we want to look tonight at the Scripture, what God calls pastors, and uh, and what He says about pastors as we look tonight in, in John the 10th chapter. John the 10th chapter, we're going to pick up and finish the chapter tonight, starting in verse uh, 22, and we'll go all the way down to the end of the chapter. As we thought and think about pastors, Jesus is the shepherd, right? Okay, He's the shepherd. And the shepherd is the head of the church, right? That we read in the Bible. Jesus is the shepherd, and the shepherd is the head of the church. Well, what are pastors in? Well, pastors are under-shepherds of the Lord Jesus Christ, and He calls them to be the leader, of course, of the local church. Whereas Jesus is the head of all churches, Jesus appoints pastors. He calls them and anoints them to be under-shepherds in each local church. There's a different one in each church. Now, there are qualities that a pastor must have. So I want to look at those qualities with you for just a second. And uh, there's several different things about them. And if you'll put that up, uh, the three characteristics of all leaders, I want you to see that there's a circle there. You see a circle going around? The three characteristics of a, of a godly pastor. The first one is... He needs to be a visionary. He needs to be able to see things that are going on. He needs to be able to see a future. He needs to be able to see a growth in the church. He needs to see people being saved. Second, he needs to be a peacemaker. He needs to be a peacemaker in the church to where when two people get at odds with each other, he's the one that can take and help resolve that. He's the one that can bring peace back into the situation when things get wrong. Now, the only way he can do that, of course, is someone comes to him and lets him know that there is a problem. And the best time to solve a problem is when it starts. That's right. And so when people come to a pastor and say, Pastor, uh, I don't know if you know that this is going on right now, but I feel like as the shepherd of the church, Jesus put you here for a reason. You have a responsibility. It's not gossip to tell the pastor when problems are in the church. It is gossip to tell anyone else. So when you hear someone talking about someone else in the church, that's gossip. But when you hear something that's wrong and come and tell the pastor, that's not gossip. That's going to the source that can solve the problem. That's to the person that's a peacemaker in the church that can take and bring peace to it. By the way, just to let you know, whenever you share with a pastor something that's going on, two people are not getting along or or rumors are going or telephone calls are flying or something like that, when you share that with a pastor, he never, ever lets it be known that you told it. It's strictly like talking to God about it so that the he can be the one that God uses to bring that uh, to resolution. So he's to be a visionary. He's to see all things, to know all things. He's to have a vision for the church. Second, he's to be a peacemaker, able to bring people back together that are at odds. And he's also a, pay, a protector. He's a protector. You see that circle around the pastor? It's like he's a superhero. That, put that, if you will, back up again there. He's to be all these different things at the exact same time. Every pastor is to have all these capabilities. He's to be a truth seeker, too. Not only a protector, not only a peacemaker, not only a visionary, but he's to be a truth seeker. He's always to be in the Word of God, seeking the truth, and sharing that truth with people all the time. And then... Fifth, he's to be an administrator. He's to be the one that can lead the church financially. He's the one that can lead the church in maintaining its facilities. He's the one that can lead the church in getting people to help him so that he doesn't have all the, the workload on him. He's to take and seek out people to do this ministry and that ministry and then supervise each of those people, being responsible for their ministry. It's his. And he's to be responsible for making sure that they carry that out. And when it doesn't happen, he's the one that people come to and say, this is a problem. And then he's not only to be an administrator, but he's also to always be a follower of the Bible. Those are the six qualities of a pastor, of a godly leader. Now, the word shepherd simply means pastor. If you take the word shepherd in the Greek language and you transfer it into Latin, Guess what word you come up with? Pastor. In the Greek, shepherd. The same word translated like transferring from English to to, to Mexicano. Uh, When you translate it, it's a different word. means the exact same thing. When you translate Greek, which the New Testament was written in, 
And Jesus is the shepherd. When you translate the word shepherd into the Latin language, which was the language that was used for offices in the church and things like that, the word is pastor. So pastor and shepherd are the exact same word, just different languages. And he's to be the uh, pastor of the church. The pastor places him underneath himself, and the pastor is under high obligation to, to nourish and to love every single member of the church. Isn't that a tough thing? Can you stop and think about how hard it is? You know, in a given congregation, you see how many people are sitting in here right now, but in this congregation there are about 100 people that I'm responsible to. If it was a corporation, a company, they would say I was the CEO and there was 100 employees out there. Some of them supervisors over different groups, but they would say that I was responsible for 100 different people. In the church, we don't think about those kinds of terms, but they're still there. He's the one that is responsible for the entire flock. In the home, though, husbands take over that role. In the homes, husbands are to be a shepherd for their family. Now, have you heard of dysfunctional families where there is no man even in the home? Have you heard of homes in which the man is not responsible, is not able to take care of the job, and the wife has to take care of those responsibilities. And all of her duties are still on her, and she takes on also the duties of the husband. The, the person that's supposed to be a shepherd leading the home is, uh, falls on her. And that can be a catastrophic problem. Imagine the church, if you will. Just imagine the church does not have a pastor. And during that time, there's no one leading, and everybody's just doing what they want to do, and everybody's... Uh, at each other's throats because they don't want to uh, do this work. They want somebody else to do it. And they're all trying to tell each other what to do. In a church, God gives a shepherd for a reason, and that is to keep all of that coordinated together. We're looking today at three characteristics of a leader, of a shepherd, of the pastor, and all the different leaders that he takes and appoints underneath him to be responsible for carrying out all the ministries of a church. You know, sometimes uh, in a... In a situation, uh, leaders are just not like they're supposed to be. I'm reminded of the story of a captain of a modern airplane. And uh, it was such a modern airplane that it was going to take its first flight. It had never flown before. And all the reporters and all the you know people like that, the newscasters, they all wanted to go on there. They wanted to take their cameras and they wanted to see this maiden flight of this airplane. They wanted us to be on it. And they had the top captain... The very best captain there was, he was an experimental pilot. He flew these kind of craft all the time. And today he was going to take and fly the airplane up, and it was going to set world records. Now, when Viola and I traveled down to Florida this past week, we traveled on a, a Delta airliner, and we flew at, a, at an altitude of about thirty to 40,000 feet, and we flew at a speed of 500 miles an hour. With this new experimental airplane was going to fly at 60,000 feet. And because it was that high, it could fly faster because the law allows it to fly faster up there. And so it was going to fly at, at uh, 1,050 miles per hour. 1,000 miles per hour. Now, Dolores, I realize you drive close to that speed, but most of us drive much slower than 1,000 miles per hour. So it was going to be a terrific flight. And all the reporters piled on. They were thrilled to death. They had the cameras and everything else. And they were no more in the air and flying along. And the captain came on the loudspeaker system. You've all heard him. And he comes on there and he wants to reassure you and calm everybody down. And he said things. He says, I'm delighted to be your pilot today. He says, I am also the captain of this airplane. I'm responsible for everything on it. Not only is he the pilot. But he is the captain. He is the shepherd of that airplane to make sure that everything works right. And he said, today is the first historical flight of this airplane. No one's ever flown on this airplane with me as I've taken and tested the airplane out. But he says, today we have a full load on here. It's its first maiden flight. Welcome to the first maiden flight. Just going along just a few minutes later, and he came back on. He said, this is your captain. He says, we have a little news that I want to share with you. He says, those of you sitting on the right side of the airplane, if you're looking out the window, you probably notice that one of the two engines over there is vibrating a lot. He says, but don't you worry about it. This plane has four engines on it. No problem. 
It wasn't long before he came back on the loudspeaker system and he said, I guess you noticed that 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 engine has gone out over there and it's not working. And he said, you probably have noticed now that the other engine is stopped also. So he said, I want you to understand, this is not a problem. This plane has four engines, two of them out, no big problem. I've compensated for the pull on one side only. We're doing just fine. He said, you're safe. Everything's good. We're still cruising at 62,000 feet, and we're still flying at 1,050 miles per hour, just like we planned. Everything is going well. wasn't very long before he came back on the loudspeaker system. He said, I got a little bit of news I need to share with you. He said, those of you sitting on the left-hand side of the airplane, you've probably noticed that we're missing one engine. One fell off a few minutes ago. He said, so we're down to one engine. And he said, we are reducing speed. We are lowering our altitude. He says, we're going down much lower. He says, not a problem. One engine can carry this airplane. We're okay. Don't worry about it. Just a short while after that, he came back on the airplane. And he sounded quite different. It just His voice wasn't the same. It just didn't sound right. And he came back on the airplane and he says, listen, I've got some bad news to tell you. He said, uh, you've probably noticed that that engine on the left side, the one that we were flying with, it's almost quit. It's barely moving. And uh, he said, but that's not the worst news. Those of you sitting on the aisle seat, if you've looked in the aisle, you've probably noticed there's a large crack going down the floor all the way from the front to the back. And you can look down and see the ocean beneath us. He says, some of you have probably noticed there's a lifeboat that has been thrown out and is down in the water underneath the airplane right now. He said, I just want you to know that this is your captain and I'm in that lifeboat. Well, it's not good for the captain to abandon the ship, is it? He should ride the ship right down into the depth of the sea and die with everybody else. And I want you to understand that Jesus, when He calls a pastor to a church, He calls for that pastor to ride the ship at 62,000 feet at 1,050 miles per hour, and He calls for the pastor to ride the waves as in the air, as the ship goes through all the different things that might happen. There's always a skipper. God is the shepherd, and the under-shepherd is the pastor of each local church. Well, as you think about these things, let's look at the true shepherd, the Jesus Himself, and how He conducted Himself with His sheep. It had been two or three months that Jesus had been preaching, and and, um, and and encountering problems from the Jews. The, the leaders of the church of that day did not like Him because they saw Him as competition for them. They saw Him as somebody that would probably try to take over the church and they would be out. Because they knew they weren't following the Bible. They knew that they, were, they didn't need a Bible. They didn't even bring one to the pulpit. They just left that laying over there. And somebody covered that piano. And uh, they, they just... Didn't need a Bible. They just talked about things. Tonight we're going to talk about finances. And I'm going to help you get control of your finances. Today I'm going to teach you how to take and pot flowers so that you'll have the most successful flowers in all the world. I'm going to tell you about personalities today and how to get along with anybody. That would hurt. But that is not what a shepherd's to be of the church. Is to follow Jesus Christ's example. So I want to look at Jesus Christ's example tonight and realize what was going on. In two or three months, the Jews were hot on his heels. They were constantly arguing with him, constantly causing him problems. And uh, what they were upset with is the fact that Jesus was claiming things about himself that only God could claim. They didn't see him as God. He hadn't announced that he was God in the flesh yet, but. He was acting like he was by the fact that he would say things that only God could say. And he was healing people in ways that only God could heal people. And it was intimidating to them because they wanted control. But it seemed like it was kind of slipping away from them. Because he was using the Bible, they weren't. And then it got down to uh, that Jesus talks about the fact that Sheep, true sheep, will not follow a false prophet. They won't follow one, no matter how good a personality, no matter how knowledgeable they are, no matter how helpful they are. Sheep will not follow a false prophet. 
when they come to the, the sheep pen and all the sheep are in the pen in the night and the shepherd comes to the gate and he calls with his voice his sheep, his sheep come out because they know his voice. But if anybody else comes and says, come on sheep, you remember me, you know who I am, they won't follow him because they know that God places in each church only one shepherd and that that's the shepherd that God has called to be there and the one that he will lead through. I want to think with you tonight as we look at these last verses found in John 10, as Jesus is entering that final phase of His ministry when He won't be able to lead anymore because the, the bad guys will overpower Him and take, and take Him to the cross and crucify Himself. Now I want you to understand something. Jesus did not get overwhelmed. He didn't abandon sheep in the lifeboat. He didn't abandon the church. He willingly chose to go to the cross and to die so that our sins could be forgiven us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You for the Word of God. And as we look tonight at the three characteristics of godly leaders, I pray, Father, that You'll speak to our heart and help us to understand what it is that You want in our lives and how You want us to conduct ourselves. Every single home is to have a godly leader. Every single church, You place a godly leader in so that that church will be able to Know the Word of God. Follow the Word of God. And all these qualities, Lord, no man could have these qualities. But Lord, You working through a pastor can provide these qualities in the church. Some as he takes and delegates responsibility and authority to do those jobs to other people. Some in which he maintains and has to do himself. But Lord, all unto You. You being the ultimate shepherd that the pastor is to follow. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, the first thing that I would say is that one of those characteristics, just one of this three now, the first one is that a godly leader, and this is a fill-in, is known by the words they say. Known by the words they say. Do you know that words can hurt? Has anybody ever said words to you that hurt you? Okay. Sometimes words that hurt us are because we're wrong. And we're challenged, and in other words, we resent being challenged because we want to be autonomous. But words can also be wrong, period. And godly leaders are known by the words they say. They're known by the words they say. Look at uh, verse uh, 22 with me here. Then the festival of dedication took place in Jerusalem, and it was in the winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in Solomon's colonnade. And then Jews surrounded him and asked, How long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, then just tell us plainly. They wanted him to just say it out loud. Now, why did they want him to say it out loud? So they could condemn him. You see, he had hinted at it, but they wanted him to say it out loud so they could condemn him. I did tell you, you don't believe Jesus said. Jesus had taught them all the things they needed to understand that he was God in the flesh. But they didn't believe it, and they wanted him to just boldly say it. Jesus answered them, The works that I do in my Father's name, they testify about me. But you don't believe me because you're not my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one's able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. And I and the Father are one. You see, the words that Jesus spoke testified as to who He was. It wasn't that He said, I am God in the flesh. It was what He taught and what He did that demonstrated who He was, that He was God. No one could say the things that Jesus said and not be God in the flesh. He spoke with authority. He spoke in challenge to all the religious words and actions of people in His day. Jesus was God in the flesh, and He was known for that by His words. Now, where was He at this particular time? It's interesting to go back and look. In Solomon's porch is where He was teaching. Solomon's porch was a long walkway outside the temple. It was on the east side of the temple. Now, by the way, if you notice, when you go to a cemetery, cemetery like uh, Fort Sam Houston, a, a national cemetery or a state cemetery like they have down at Corpus Christi, 
you'll see that the graves all line up with the headstones facing the east. The reason is that it's always been said that the Messiah would come from the east. You remember in Bethlehem's story that we'll be studying this month that they set a star in the east, led the shepherds to where they were to go. The east has always been important to, to the biblical times and to, to the coming of God. And he was standing there on the east side of the temple, and it was a place called Solomon's Colonnade or Solomon's Porch. It was named after him. And there on that long porch, it had a beautiful roof over it. It looked out on the Kidron Valley, which was beautiful. Jesus prayed there often. And it provided underneath that a beautiful shelter, a shelter from the heat in the summer and from the cold rain in the winter. Jesus used it as a center of His teaching. You see, Jesus was not invited to come into the church and teach, but the temple all around it is where the women could come. It was a place that anybody could gather. It, it is where sick people came and were laid, and they, they were there. It was a place that provided a haven for people to come and be near the church. Those kind of people that, that say, you know, I'll never be welcome at your church. I want you to know all people are welcome at this church. This church invites the down and out. It invites the people who can't do anything to help. It invites everyone to come and to hear the Word of God. They're important, just like everybody is important. And Jesus found this to be a convenient place to teach. People gathered around. And when Jesus would begin to teach, people would gather and they would listen to Him. And the Jewish leaders they would come, referred to as the Jews, when they would come, their purpose was to listen carefully, catch Him in a word that He said, and then arrest Him and throw Him in jail and crucify Him. That was their goal all along during His three years of ministry. But they never seemed to be able to get there because Jesus would slip away just before they could arrest Him and just before they could take Him, take him into cuffs. He was there preaching and teaching. And when He taught, He taught about the Messiah. The Messiah would come, and of course He was the Messiah. He was God in the flesh. He'd come from heaven. The Messiah would come from the east. And they denied it. I want you to hear me real carefully when I say this. There are many religions today, most religions today, that teach that the Messiah, that God has not come yet, that Jesus was merely a prophet. They don't believe that God has come. There are many Christian churches today that teach that the Messiah has not come. You'll recognize those churches by the fact that there's their leader. He has a book, maybe. Normally he'll have a computer, but I won't throw it on the keys this time. But this is how he teaches. And he doesn't teach from the Bible. That's why he doesn't need a Bible. And they call themselves Christian churches. Well, in Jesus' day, the big temple, the religion of all the Jews, the place where non-Jews came and wanted to know God, that's exactly how they taught in that day too. They didn't use the Bible because they didn't want to teach what was in the Bible for two reasons. Number one, because they didn't believe it. And number two, because God had not spoken to man through preachers, if you please, through the Jewish church, he had not spoken to man for over 400 years. 400 years God had been silent and not spoken, not revealed Himself through the Scripture. They could read it, but it didn't make any sense, so they stopped reading it. And that's the way many churches are today that are outside the will of God. Now, please understand, I believe the majority of Christian churches are godly churches and have godly leaders. Don't get me wrong. But there are those that don't, and many religions out there of which they teach that Jesus is not God, that He never was. That he, At the most, they say He was a prophet. He was a great teacher. Well, Jesus is preaching, and in His preaching, His words just seem to come out to where He says, without saying the exact word, He says, if you hear Me, you're hearing God. So he is claiming to be the Messiah without saying, I am the Messiah. And so the Jewish religion, they leaned on every word. They just wanted him to go one step further so they could arrest him for blasphemy, for claiming to be God. 
But he never went there. His words clearly taught who he was, and his actions clearly taught it by the miracles he did that only God could do, but he never stated it. He would say things uh, that, that only he could do. No one, no one has the right to be to claim to be one of Christ's sheep if he lives in willful, that's one of your fill-ins, in willful disobedience. If he chooses to live in a way that goes against Scripture. Have you ever heard anybody say, well, I know what the Bible says, but I don't believe it. That's called willful disobedience. And also, persistent, they continue to believe it, they continue to push it, they're openly disobedient. They say, I know what the Bible teaches, but I don't believe it, so I'm not going to do it. I believe that's good for some people, but it's not good for me. I believe God will let me live this way. It doesn't matter what the Bible says. I believe that God will accept me the way I am and that God will accept what I'm doing. And they refuse to do something about it. In other words, they continue to live that way. You ever felt guilty when you read the Bible, felt guilty and said, you know, I'm just not doing that? That's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. That's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. Yesterday I started to shut something, and when I did, I realized my hand was in the way, and I stopped quickly and got my hand out of the way before it closed. And I wondered, what will I do if that happened to be the case? It was a trunk on my car. And if it had closed and closed, then I would have to reach into my pocket find my cell phone or find the keys and take and punch the truck and open it up. And I thought to myself, would I have the mental ability to do all of that with my hands smashed in the trunk? Now, my dear friend, that happens when you go to the point that you literally put your hand in the trunk and shut the trunk on and say, well, I'd never do that. Well, I want you to know there's some people that know what the Bible says. And they willingly put the hand in the trunk. In other words, they willingly do what the Bible says don't do. And that's called willful, persistent, and open disobedient. And they refuse to do something about their problem. Just as there were false shepherds then, there's still false shepherds today. There's still pastors that are not what they're called to be. Look at Matthew 7, verse 23 with me. Matthew 7, verse 23, we read, Then I will announce them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. Who is he talking about? He's talking about pastors who stood up and taught the Word of God, but they did not believe what they taught. And they taught against the Word of God by adding in their own stuff rather than taking and teaching what the Bible says. And they willfully went against the Word of God. You know, I find where I go wrong the most is in areas that I don't understand. I do not for the life of me understand how a person can come and be a pastor of a church and not go to a Bible college and study the Word of God underneath somebody that examines them, that knows the Word of God and examines them and, and not only teaches them, but tests them to see if they know it. Uh, it's such a responsibility. Now listen to me carefully. Are you listening? Fathers, you have that same responsibility in your home. Same. And ignorance, not knowing what it says, no excuse. Leaders in the church, you have that same responsibility and not wanting to not caring about it wanting to do something different no excuse and Jesus said in that day when you stand before God the Father in heaven and he says why should I let you into heaven and you say I was a pastor of a church I was a minister in a church I was a department leader I, I did this and that I was a father in my home and God takes and flashes before your life all those willful disobediences of the Word of God. He says, depart from me. Never knew you. The little boy wanted $100 so bad. He wanted it really bad. 
And so he decided, since he couldn't raise it and couldn't get it, that he would take and, and write a letter. And he would write that letter, and he would send it to God. So he wrote the letter out as best as he could. He put it in an envelope, put a stamp on it, and he mailed it to God. Post office got a hold of it, of course. They looked down at it, and they said, what's going on here? And they, you know, in Santa Claus, they take and forward those to organizations that take and handle Santa Claus mail. They stay in time because there is no, well, anyway. And so what about God? So the post office, of course, they didn't believe there was a God either. So where did they send this to? You said, well, they sent it to a church. I'm sorry. They weren't godly believers. They didn't even go to church on Sunday. They sent it to the President of the United States. Have you ever known a president that acted like he was God? In fact, I've only known probably about eight in my lifetime, and every one of them acted like God. And literally, they have the power to act that way and get away with it. I've never known one. Some people say, well, the current president acts that way. But you don't know much about presidents. I've lived underneath a bunch of presidents, and every one of them, the people said the same thing about every one of them. Tremendous power. They act like this one got the letter. The president looked at it, and he said, what a sweet letter. He says, we're going to help this boy. So he told one of his people, he says, I want you to take and send that boy some money. He said, send him $5. Remember, he asked for 100 Send him $5. That'll thrill that little boy to death to get $5 in the mail from the President of the United States. The little boy got the letter and he opened it, gladly saw it was from the President of the United States. He was surprised because he had sent it to God. So he figured, well, I guess God uses the President to send stuff to people. So he took it and opened up and he found a $5 bill in it. He was excited. He was ecstatic. He was thrilled to death to get $5. So he sat down and he wrote God a thank you letter. He said, Dear God, thank you so much for sending the money to me. But I do not understand why you sent it through Washington. As usual, they took 95% of it. Well, sometimes uh, it's not what we think it should be. But it was known by his words. But second, he was known by his works. He was known by his work. As you think about the works that he does and and how he, he's a champion in his works. What are the works that, that Jesus talks about? Look at verse 31 with me. In verse 31, it, it goes on to say, And again the Jews picked up rocks to stone him. You think they were upset with Jesus? He was teaching. He was God. He was teaching the Word of God that they had but they weren't using. He was teaching from the Bible which they had but didn't understand anymore. For 400 years. 400 years. Dor- Doris, you're, you're not quite that old, but you can understand what 400 years is by the length of time you've been on the earth. 400 years, nobody had heard from God. And Jesus was preaching as if He was God and His works backed up what He said. They couldn't escape the fact that His miraculous works were what was going on here. Look back at the Scripture, verse 32 with me. And it says in the Scripture... We're stoning you for a good reason. And I have shown you my good works from the fathers. Which of these works are you stoning for me? Stoning me for? We're not stoning you for good work, the Jews answered, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself God. And Jesus answered and said, Isn't it written in your law that I said you are gods? The Bible tells us that. And he said, I call those from whom the Word of God came gods, and the Scripture cannot be broken. And did you say you're blaspheming to the one the Father set apart and sent into this world because I said, I am the Son of God? If I am not doing my Father's work, don't believe me. But if I am doing the works of my Father, doing them, and you don't believe me, Believe the works. The way you, this way you will know and understand that the Father's in me and I am in the Father. As we look over in Scripture in Psalms 82, verse 1, we read, God standing in the divine assembly and then He pronounces judgment among the gods. God's talking to gods. And verse 6 says, I said, you are gods. You're all sons of the Most High. Now you see in the Old Testament, even God referred to leaders as gods. Now let me give you an example of a god. 
You ready for this? Get a speeding ticket. Tell the policeman, I wasn't speeding, and you'll meet God. When he said, yes, you were. Go down to the courthouse, and when you meet with the magistrate down there, tell him, the policeman was wrong. I wasn't speeding. And you'll meet God. The magistrate will say, $300. Pay the bailiff as you're going out. You see, God was saying, we refer to many leaders as if they're gods because they act like they're gods. And they're supposed to act like they're gods. We, we need those law officials to act like that. I have ne- I've gotten a ticket before. But I have never gotten a ticket I was guilty for. You you know what I mean, don't you? I have seen the red lights come on behind my car, and every time they did, the policeman was wrong. I wasn't wrong. And see, we act like gods. And Jesus said, you permit that to go on in your society. All I said is, I am a son of God. What's wrong with that? You permit that from people all the time. But they knew what he meant, and they knew that he meant that he was very, not just the Son of God in the general sense that we use it, but that he was the Messiah, which is translated from the Hebrew into the Greek as Son of God, Messiah. God's anointed come to earth. Look at John 2, verse 17 with me. You have a fill-in down there in just a few moments that I'll give you. And his disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal. For your house will consume me. In other words, get excited about the house of God. And the Jews replied to him, What sign will you show us for doing these things? And Jesus answered, You destroy the temple, and I'll raise the temple up in three days. Can you imagine if God was standing here, not me, but God was standing here, and He said, You destroy this church. Don't witness the people. Don't bring people into it. Allow this church to continue to decline. Allow it to get to the point it can't pay its finances. Allow the church to be closed and sold to maybe a bar for a a business here and and there not be a church here. Allow that to happen, Jesus says. And go back to the verse again. And Jesus says, and I'll raise it up. So the Jews replied to him, What sign will you give us that you're going to do these things? Jesus answered, You destroy the temple, and I'll raise it up in three days. And therefore the Jews said, This temple took 46 years to build, and you say you'll raise it up in three days? But Jesus was speaking about the temple of His body. You kill me, you crucify me, and in three days I'll rise from the dead, is what He was talking about. So when He raised from the dead, His disciples remembered what He had said, and they believed the Scriptures and the statement that Jesus had made. So it's not only the words that Jesus says, but the works that Jesus did. And Jesus' works and statements called Him a Son of God. That's a fill-in. Jesus' works and His words called Him a Son of God. And then last, as I close, He was known by who? By who? Who is Jesus? He had wisdom. Godly leaders will have wisdom. You know another name for wisdom? Knowledge. They'll know the Word of God. Godly leaders will know the Word of God. When you ask them a question, they'll be able to give you an answer. They may have to look it up, but they'll know where to go to look it up. And they'll know how to understand what they find when they find it in there and help you to see what it says. And you can look at it and study it from all kinds of sources and find out that they are wise, that they do understand the Scriptures. Listen carefully. Fathers, that's your responsibility in the home. What an awesome thing you have in a local church pastor who knows and has studied and been tested and approved in the Word of God to teach you the Word of God. Because the responsibility is there whether you know it or not. I want you to understand. One day when I lived in this neighborhood, I rode my motorcycle up to the intersection over here. And when I did, 
I looked around. No cars were coming. I was on the way to a funeral. Had a suit and tie on. And so I just slowed down, pulled out, and pulled onto the road. Policeman saw me and knew I was headed for a funeral and thought I needed a police escort. At least that's what I would have liked to have thought. But actually he pulled me over and he said, you had a rolling stop. I said, what is that? He said, you didn't put both feet down on the ground in that motorcycle. You didn't stop. We need to realize that we are known who we are. And that's what godly leaders are to be known. What is their life like? Jesus said, the Father's in me and I'm in the Father. And they didn't listen to Him. He took and He taught the Word of God and they tried to kill Him. So He withdrew from there and He withdrew from there. He went over by the Jordan to the east side of the Jordan, which is called Perea in some places in the Bible and Bethany in other places. And that's where John the Baptist had preached. That's where when Jesus, when He first came and identified who He was, He came down to the river where John the Baptist was baptized and and Jesus said to John the Baptist, Baptize me. And John the Baptist said, I have need to be baptized of you. And comest thou to be baptized of me? And Jesus said, Suffer it to be so. In other words, let it happen. Why was Jesus baptized? He had never sinned. He was baptized to demonstrate to that group that was there, that church group that was there, that he, like they, believed in God and he came underneath the accountability of John's teaching. He came underneath the leadership of John the Baptist. Now it was a short period of time after that that Jesus began his own ministry. And it was a very short period of time before John the Baptist was arrested and his head was cut off. Jesus said there's never been a greater man than John the Baptist. What was so great about John the Baptist? When Jesus came walking up on the hillside... John the Baptist, without knowing anything about him, he knew he was his cousin, but without knowing anything else, John the Baptist looked and said, there's the Messiah, there's the Son of God. How did he know that? Because he knew the Scriptures, and he recognized him, showed up. In and Jesus says, He is greater among men. I want you to understand something. Jesus is saying that about you, you come to the point to say, Jesus he is God. You follow Him in believer's baptism after you make that decision. You follow Him in believer's baptism and you join a local church saying, Jesus is God and I want to be underneath the shepherd that God has sent. Grow in to learn the Bible. That's so important. Here people listened and they responded and the belief led one woman of Samaria to follow Jesus. And then she began to witness to other people. And many were saved through this one woman's witness. Who's been saved this week underneath your ministry? I want to encourage you to do something. Listen to me real carefully. I'd like for this week you to bring someone to church to hear the Word of God preached. God will be here. I will preach from the Bible and I will teach from the Bible. Preaching means what I'm doing to encourage you. What teaching means as I talk, take the Bible and I go verse by verse with you. I preach and I teach. And I will do the same when they come. And then we will depend upon the Holy Spirit of God to convict their heart to give their life to Jesus. You'll never have a better feeling. Never have a better feeling then the person you brought to church who thought, they'll never join a church. They'll never. They're coming with me just for one reason. That's because I hound them to death. And when they walk down that aisle and give their life to Jesus and they get believer's baptism, they join the church, you have never experienced the feeling you're going to experience when that happens. There's only one better feeling. How many of you have grandchildren? If you could spend the evening with your child or your grandchild, how many of you would say, I'd spend it with my grandchild? Every one of you. I want you to know that when that person comes to know Jesus, listen to me carefully, and then they lead somebody to know the Lord, that's your grandchild to the Lord. Because you led them to know Jesus Christ, and when they lead somebody else, that will be your grandchild in the Lord. How many children do you have in the Lord? How many grandchildren do you have in the Lord? As we close, 
Jesus said, we'll be, He'll be known by the works, and His pastors will be known by the words they say, and by the works that they do, and by who they are personally. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank You for tonight. Thank You, Heavenly Father, that You love us and You called us according to Your purposes to live godly lives like You do. Father, we're all sinners. We all make mistakes and we all uh, fall very short of being what we're called to be. All we have to do is confess it to You, Lord, and You restore us and use us, not because we're worthy, but because You've called us. Touch our hearts. Touch our minds. I pray tonight that someone here Someone here that you've touched will come forward and say, Pastor, I need to take a step toward Jesus in a new way. Pray for me. Thank you, Jesus. Would you stand together and sing with us? We begin to sing, You Come, God's Waiting on You.